and welcome. Today I'm going to give you some context of my research on the Flat Earth Movement by reading the letter I wrote to the editors of the New Yorker regarding the piece by Alan Burdick, which I also analyze in detail. Academics tend to take the New Yorker seriously because it has this aura of intellectuality. It is a trendy publication that especially students in English want to publish it. Supposedly, the New Yorker is a bridge between the public world and the academic world, and publishing there gives you a lot of prestige. The first people who drew my attention to this piece by Burdick were in the Flat Earth community, and later anthropologists sent it to me and asked what I thought about it. So I eventually wrote a letter to the New Yorker. The piece, as expected from mainstream journalists, somebody who worked at the New York Times before, provides a very poor analysis of the Flat Earth community. And so I decided to write a letter to the New Yorker editors. They, of course, never responded because my letter was critical of the worker Burdick. That piece has no comments whatsoever. The New Yorker obviously is edited very heavily, and it does not provide a forum for discussions with the public. So I will first read you my letter, and I will later read through my notes and analysis of Burdick's piece in more detail. Dear New Yorker editors, I am a professional social and cultural anthropologist, and I have been working on an ethnography of the modern Flat Earth movement. I am interviewing people from this movement and trying to understand how they think the way they do and how they got there. For me, this movement is asking a fundamental question regarding the nature of knowledge. How do we know what we think we know? This movement represents, at the very least, an important epistemological challenge and sincere scientists should welcome it. The fact that they have failed to address the points raised by key proponents of this movement is responsible for its exponential growth. Burdick's New Yorker piece misrepresents a number of people and their positions. Burdick makes a long list of rookie mistakes. He also never touches upon the theme that the professed cosmologies of several indigenous and ancient cultures, including the Hebrew, Chaldean, Egyptian, and Chinese, are compatible with the claims of modern Flat Earth proponents. There are too many issues with Burdick's piece to address in a short letter. His piece will eventually backfire, for as soon as an audience of non-slumbering robots start testing his claims and looking up the channels of those he mentions, they will realize that he was being either disingenuous, acting naively on his own prejudices, or being intentionally malicious, since he mischaracterizes Flat Earth researchers and their arguments. Burdick associates Donald Trump's election with the International Flat Earth Conference, adding how much money people pay to attend it, which are unrelated non sequiturs. People also pay a hefty sum to listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson speak about theoretical physics. They also spend a lot of money to attend music festivals or to listen to Kanye West. Yet, Burdick's poorest moment, which is reactionary at best, is his insinuation that YouTube is simply a source of misinformation, whereas a great diversity of points of view can be found on YouTube a platform that actually and generally supports free speech and expression. Burdick claims that lighthouses are tall in order to be seen over the intervening curve of sea, quoting him. Whereas that is true in a flat plain, lighthouses would have to be tall in order to be seen over long distances. An elementary knowledge of perspective proves this point. Burdick did not address the claim that people are able to bring back into view boats that have vanished beyond the horizon. Burdick fails to notice that people who have attempted to reproduce Eratosthenes' often mentioned experiment have shown that it could work just as well on a flat or a curved surface depending on how far the sun is positioned. 
the idea that this experiment from antiquity conducted with sticks in a well and measured without a standard system is taken seriously has been a source of derision and makes science writers like Burdick sound uneducated in experimental science and poor at elementary reasoning and math. Burdick goes on to claim that one could see to the edge of the world with a strong enough telescope disregarding completely the role of the atmosphere or air density which makes it impossible. There are no key researchers in the Flat Earth movement making such a claim. Some realists would ask, what difference does knowing any of this does in my life whether the Earth is a flat plane or a spinning ball? They have things to do, places to be, mouths to feed, and many have never cared about space, Star Wars, Star Trek, or NASA. They do, however, care about what they see as the waste of funds that go into space programs while so many people are surviving at the edge of poverty and starvation. This is what they may find truly unnerving and which seems to fit all the meanings of the word. So that was the letter that got no response, of course. And now we'll move into my notes on Burdick's piece, which go into a little bit more detail. So first thing I noted was that Burdick's piece starts out by mentioning Mad Mike, who received a lot of negative attention and ridicule from the media when he announced that he was going to fly in a homemade rocket to prove that the Earth is flat. He was a recent convert to the notion that the Earth is not a spinning ball, and many people in the Flat Earth movement saw the media's focus on Mad Mike as a derailment. In other words, according to this view, the media was simply targeting someone who was marginal in the movement and who had the claim that most people would find ludicrous. This would serve to make the entire movement, community and awakening look worse than it already did. Now I mentioned Chris Monk, who was one of my interviewees and now has turned around and is not a flat earther and he admitted that he was basically infiltrating the movement. But in a chat about the New Yorker piece, on June 3rd, 2018, he told me that Burdick made rookie mistakes, such as misassociating researchers in the movement and risking libel by association. For Chris, Burdick defamed Mark Sargent and Jaron Campanella by associating them with Eric Dubay, who is, I quote Chris here, an anti-Jew and pro-Hitler promoter. For Chris, Burdick's rookie mistake is not having been able to distinguish Sargent, Campanella and Dubé as not having very much in common apart from the conviction that the Earth is not a spinning ball. For Chris, and I quote, Dubé is clearly doing such anti-Jew, pro-Hitler things that he has been outcast by the Flat Earth community in general. Chris Monk also pointed out that Burdick's article misses this point completely. For Chris, Burdick is promoting atheism, scientism, evolution versus creation, materialism and profit, while calling Jaron and others liars in public. For Chris, Mr. Burdick, and I quote, is a master of the double and tender, meant to confuse and obfuscate his own personal position, managing to write as if he is a flat earth advocate and adversary simultaneously, which I don't think Burdick really does. Burdick writes that the earth really is flat because dozens, if not hundreds of YouTube videos describe the cover up. Burdick's statement is not factual and clearly ironic. He's making the question ridiculous by pointing to YouTube instead of the actual arguments and experiments that have been made. The tone of ridicule is clear in the illogical statement that since something is on YouTube, it is therefore real. It goes hand in hand, however, with the notion that I've seen on television, so it must be real. Ironically, flat earth proponents ridicule lunar landing believers for the same reason since they claim that since they saw the lunar landings on television, that they must be real. In addition, 
NASA's International Space Station, which Flat Earth proponents have shown to be a charade, is mostly promoted through YouTube as well. We do not live in a world where bizarre theories are on YouTube and anything else is in the school and university system. We live in a world where everything is on YouTube. However, people select what they want to take seriously from YouTube, which allows anyone to post content within certain boundaries, such as not breaking copyright laws. Moreover, the belief that the Earth is a spinning ball, if one investigates the history of it in detail, did not take place suddenly, but gradually, became dominant, standardized, and portrayed as unquestionable. As Luka Popov, a physicist at the University of Zagreb, Croatia, has shown, quote, the observed diurnal and annual motion of the Earth can just as well be accounted as the diurnal rotation and annual revolution of the universe around the fixed and centered Earth by using Mach's principle on his paper from 2013. Burdick's narrative is itself full of wonkiness as it mixes evidence with information that people would discredit, such as mixing evidence with the supposed authority of a professional basketball player featured in mainstream news hit pieces. For instance, Burdick points out that the Chicago skyline can be seen from over 50 miles away, which is not possible where the earth really curved, and follows that up with a sarcastic irony. We know because last February, Kyrie Irving, the Boston Celtics point guard, told us so. In fact, photographs of objects seen from impossible distances, if the Earth were a sphere or a spinning ball, have been discussed among flat Earth proponents since 2015, years before Irving's conversion. Burdick's rhetorical trick and sarcastic irony comes across clearly in the told us so. Conveniently, Burdick does not get into the many told us so that Flat Earth researchers link to NASA and have been deconstructing. For instance, we all know that the International Space Station is shooting at a speed of 17,134.93 miles per hour, over 22 times the speed of a speeding bullet which goes at 767 miles per hour, or the speed of sound, because NASA told us so. The authority of NASA is so ingrained in American society due to its domination of the educational system that going against it, despite its bizarre and demonstrably false claims, is automatically interpreted as a sign of insanity. And yet, asking hard questions, retesting, and pursuing independent confirmation is how basic and credible science is conducted. As social scientists have been very well aware of, non-conformity to dominant models and ways of knowing can lead to social marginalization, just as it has been documented in the experiences of many Flat Earth proponents and researchers. Burdick's next Burdick move comes in the same paragraph. Applying some Ciceronian rhetorical technique that is repeating his mantra we know because, to start his phrase, he associates the election of the almost universally detested Donald Trump with what he claimed erroneously to be the first ever Flat Earth Conference. Burdick's research betrays his Americanist bias. NBA players, Trump obsession, and America-centered characters, whereas the Flat Earth movement has always been international. Burdick even adds the price of the conference to make an impact on his readers. Wow, Trump was elected and they paid as much as $249 each to attend this wonky conference. We can hear the readers reacting, how gullible people are. In the paragraph that follows, Burdick sounds like what flat earth researchers call closeted flat earther, someone who fears to admit that they give any credence to claims associated with the movement. Burdick puts scientism in square quotes, probably unaware of how seriously the notion has been taken among social scientists and philosophers. He then admits that he had to sit through hours of presentations and sat with an assortment of unfailingly earnest and lovely people, including 
IT specialists, cops, college students, and fashionably dressed families with young children in order to understand why a growing number of people are dead certain that the earth is flat and explains it with the punchline because the truth is unnerving. Unnerving is an interesting word choice with a range of meanings such as a loss of confidence, discouragement, disconcerting, frightened, dismay, etc. Burdick then continues with a description of the conference rooms and shifts his focus to Darren Marbo, whom he describes as an African-American and one of a handful of people of color in the room, who happens to be an Iraq war veteran. This is Burdick's backhanded way of saying that flat earth proponents are mostly white people. Burdick already associated them with Trump, so he must peg them to an allusion to a hint of racism. Burdick, again, instead of dealing with actual claims and information, focuses on the supposed YouTube menace, the virtual place of free speech that is not sanctioned by mainstream news, and yet, curiously, a virtual place where one can find any piece of mainstream news. As I have hinted here, the notion that YouTube is a source of poor information because it is a democratic space and is not controlled by the editorial boards of mainstream agencies is reactionary. Burdick claims that Marble and his girlfriend drank in YouTube. The choice of the verbal form drank is telling. It alludes subtly to getting drunk and losing one's mind. Burdick continues along similar lines of comical caricaturing and distortion, claiming that Marble saw the light in his YouTube sidebar. By this point of this analysis, my view starts shifting towards the notion that Burdick is not a master of language unless it is Orwellian doublespeak or doublethink. Burdick continues with the claim that Mark Sargent is a proselytizer, whereas in fact, Sargent is not even religious. Burdick does this in order to paint a picture of Marble as a gullible follower of a supposed cult of Mark Sargent. Proselytizing religions like the Mormons go knocking on doors personally in order to make converts. Burdick does not account for the criticisms that Sargent has received from Flat Earth proponents regarding his claim that we are in an enclosed world that is similar to the one portrayed in The Truman Show. Flat Earth researchers have managed to agree to disagree and eventually collaborate, which is a rare thing even among social science academics. They all agree that they do not know everything, whereas others expect them to have answers to every single question that mainstream science claims to know for sure. Burdick notes that Sargent has a subscription website that charges $10 a month and insinuates that Sargent's Flat Earth Clues series is only available through this subscription. The idea is to portray Sargent as a money-hungry exploiter of supposedly gullible people such as Marble. Burdick is building simplistic strawman caricatures that are only convincing to people who know nothing about those he discusses. In the following paragraph, Burdick makes the claim that this is the post-truth era since other people's version of the truth is not agreeable to the mainstream. He, again, brings into the piece Trump, who has nothing to do with it, to make his point betraying his Americanist bias. Yet, as all anthropologists are keenly aware, the postmodern critique brought in a reflexive critique of ethnographic knowledge that shook the field in the late 1980s. We also note that the anti-materialist position of most indigenous people around the world is not compatible with the views of mainstream science. Uh, it's very difficult to explain uh, if people are not accustomed to spiritual experiences. And anthropologists have written about cultural and linguistic relativism for many decades. Burdick coming from an Anglo-centric and Americanist literature-oriented position would, of course, miss that boat and pick up on what sounds trendy to his pseudo-intellectual audience. Burdick brings Trump with Seinfeld together as he's speaking with an American audience and attempting to fill space that, were he a serious researcher, would be filled with actual arguments. Jerry, just remember. It's not a lie, if you believe it. 
his cherry-picking statements from Marble and Sargent in order to make the one gullible and the other the deceiver. I uh, woke up with 15,000 subscribers this morning. In no place does Burdick challenge NASA's authority as a serious, critical scientist would. This beautiful theater. Burdick follows up with a cursive examination of Samuel Robotham, whom he characterizes as a religious fundamentalist who ridiculed evolution. Of course, the Piltdown Man hoax was created to provide the missing link to Darwin's theory. Darwin's books such as Emotions in Man and Animals and The Descent of Man for modern readers are so full of racism and sexism that his so-called scientific theories should be discredited. The reason they are not is because he was English and from Cambridge, a phenomenon we see with the works of Stephen Hawking, who somehow found out the theory of everything, and Richard Dawkins, who claims in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, that if you throw the disconnected pieces of a jumbo jet up in the sky enough times, they will eventually fall together as a working airplane. And people think Dawkins is a reasonable thinker because he poses as an atheist, skeptic, materialist. Burdick's narrative brings together several elements to make up a caricature that is appealing to his audience of liberal science fiction and NASA fans. YouTube research is stupid, Trump and fake news, Bible bashing 19th century religious fundamentalism. Needless to say that Copernicus, Brahe and Kepler were all religious. But materialistic science is an art of cherry picking, so this fact is hardly if ever mentioned. Burdick claims that Aristotle observed how stars behave south of the equator, but Aristotle was in Greece and that's north of the equator. He didn't go to the south of the equator to observe stars, so that's not possible. He also portrays Eratosthenes' claims regarding shadows as credible without question, whereas they have been mathematically proven questionable by flat earth researchers such as Dr. Zach and others who have used 3D software to model the experiment. Eratosthenes' claims are still considered evidence even though his method is not reproduced routinely and his measurements could not possibly be accurate. People who have tried to reproduce his shadow experiment showed that it works on a flat surface with a smaller and closer sun like the one we can see and with a curved surface and a very far away and larger sun. Eratosthenes measured could be explained by a flat earth if the sun were only a few thousand miles away and 32 miles across. The math would work out the same. The problem that often escapes the perception of Eratosthenes' proponents is that we can film the sun growing and getting smaller throughout the day as it moves closer during sunrise and farther sunset. This was initially denied since in the ball earth model the sun's size could never change but the photographic evidence that the sun does indeed change sizes during the day is by now overwhelming. And there's a video by this guy, Wolfie, who is claiming that the sun is not changing sizes. And you can go and download that video and put it in the software, get the beginning and the end of the video, and you will see that there is a change in the size of the sun. And it is done with a solar filter with the idea that there's no change because there's no glare. But in fact, there is a change if you measure it. And I've done that. Burdick goes on to claim that one could see to the edge of the world with a strong enough telescope, disregarding completely the role of the atmosphere or air density in making it impossible. This argument is, for most flat earth researchers, a long dead horse or a pulverized skeleton. Burdick then follows through with false statements, such as the idea that engineers take Earth's curvature into account. This was not true for Romans building aqueducts, as it was not true for the builders of the underwater tunnel between England and France, or regarding train tracks. Burdick continues with the idea that lighthouses are tall to go over the intervening curve of sea and finishes with the claim that there are millions of examples of photographic evidence of a globular planet since the 1950s. He seems to be way off and if his readers believe these claims, the joke is on them. 
Burdick mischaracterizes the argument that flat earth researchers make regarding rockets, whereas flat earth researchers argue that the ground video of rockets going up show them making a continuous arc towards the ocean, always in full view, and then viewers see a switch into a cartoonish computer-generated image of the rocket in orbit, Burdick claims that during those televised rocket launches, the switch that flat earth researchers see is from a ground-up shot to one supposedly on the rocket itself, looking back towards Earth. So he didn't even look that up. He didn't even watch any launches or any videos about this. He's just basically mischaracterizing what he saw at the conference that he attended. Burdick probably prays that his audience does not pay attention to details and has never watched rocket launches. Plus, Burdick hints that since the launches are televised, well, guess what? They must be real and no questioning is possible. Burdick then characterizes Flat Earth's research as watching more YouTube videos and boning up on scripture. He then goes on a rant because Flat Earth researchers are questioning gravity, blissfully unaware of the electromagnetic models and the connection to the plasma science behind the electric universe model and the cosmic background radiation measurements. By the final paragraphs, Burdick is a proponent of a single Flat Earth logic that he finds mesmerizing and maddening. He seems to have been a victim of his own research abilities and epistemological biases. His piece is a showpiece of analytical incapacity, dizzied by the clutter that he has cherry-picked while forgetting that in any field there is much speculation. Flat Earth researchers are attempting to reconstruct an epistemology having to start from scratch and without any help, only condemnation. Burdick, claiming to be a friend, joins the bullying forum and fails to understand. He provides information that has been proven wrong as if it were obvious and mischaracterizes every single person he mentions. Many will accept this New Yorker piece simply because it might be flattering to be mentioned and in the hopes that it brings people to their channels. However, Burdick's rhetoric reminds me of the documentary Behind the Curve, which goes out of its way to make flat earth researchers look silly, adding fuel to the stereotypes. I personally think that this is cowardice because people give up their time to talk to the journalists or documentary makers with the idea they will be treated fairly. Yet, the results are geared for pleasing an audience and making money, which means that a lot of the material, the time that people gave in goodwill, will be wasted, thrown away, or edited to make them look silly. Burdick's most human moments come when he takes into consideration people's account of being the victims of prejudice and bullying, and the fear of marginalization and ridicule that many have experienced before coming out. But his focus on human experiences is very short, and he goes back to his previous pattern, accepting a monolithic science as unquestionable and flat earth researchers as unstable, people in denial. Burdick should investigate just how light years are measured, and at the very least look into some standard critiques of materialistic science, such as Rupert Sheldrake's The Science Delusion. But I said, well then what about Big G, the gravitational constant known in the trade as Big G, it's written with a capital G, Newton's universal gravitational constant. That's varied by more than 1.3% in recent years. Um, and it seems to vary from place to place and from time to time. And he said, oh, well, those are just errors. And uh, unfortunately, there are quite big errors with big G. But Burdick is not interested in that. For him, astronomy has standard facts that he argues are emotionally untenable to flat Earth researchers, like Jaron Campanella, who believes that space is fake. Yet, we should make it clear that the space that Campanella is skeptical of is the one portrayed by space agencies and Star Wars science fiction and not the space surrounding us in the world. Burdick then returns to attack Samuel Robotham as a quack who was simply hungry for money as one of his contemporaries claimed. 
Burdick is building up steam for his half-baked argument that the Flat Earth Movement may be simply a scam, an emotional solve with no basis in physical reality that becomes both real and surreal, just like science fiction. Flat Earth researchers could say the exact same thing about SpaceX and NASA. For Burdick, the Flat Earth community has stepped into a form of mental perpetual motion, if you think it must be true. He claims that Flat Earth proponents are devoted to solipsism as the new empiricism. Burdick seems to have been catching on, as this is the argument that Flat Earth researchers have made regarding the spinning ball Earth, modern astronomy, and NASA's SpaceX fanboys. They managed to first think about, then invent ways of detecting gravitational waves, dark matter, and dark energy, simply because theory did not fit observations. Gravity was supposed to hold the whole galaxy and the rest of the universe together, but when it did not make sense and the computer models that somehow test such theories failed, dark matter was invented to save the day, and it became the most abundant thing in the universe, beyond our senses and ability to detect it. The LIGO machine, that is essentially the michelson morley experiment in a grand scale, somehow measured gravitational waves from distant black holes orbiting one another, but it was not shaken by any earthquakes or other environmental noise. LIGO presented findings that looked like half-baked computer-generated animations, and yet astronomers were detecting microwave ovens as some mysterious cosmic signal, as you see in this piece from The Guardian. And that took 17 years. So 17 years they were investigating this amazing cosmic radiation, but it was just a microwave oven next door.